anyone heard this quote before? I don't know why I'm using it now, I know you're wondering. What a lot of people don't know, because I'm sure everyone has come across this before, is that it was actually written by Benjamin Franklin in 1789. And it had very little to do with death and taxes and everything to do with change management. So you ask why? But Franklin, as far back as 350 years ago, was talking about change in the world because it was at the time of the French Revolution. And he was worried that the Constitution being written wasn't going to be enduring. And it was actually in a letter to a French scientist at the time. And the thing that's interesting to me in this quote, and the reason I put it up here, is because whether it's 250 years ago, whether it's today, today in this fast-paced digital world we live in, whenever a person's involved, whenever a person's security, comfort, whenever life is not so predictable, when any, any of that is threatened, you find that change is important. We all go through change. So it was as relevant 250 years ago as it is today because an individual was at the center of what was happening. So, the DNA of our change management, what is organizational change made up of? Firstly, people, we understand this, there's cultures, stakeholders, reporting lines, roles, etc. There's processes, there's systems. But the important thing is that when you make a change to any one of these, it has an impact generally on anything else. So in any organization, you'll find these elements. But we often, so often, will make a change to one thing and think we can contain that change and train against the change and just deal with it, but we don't apply the principles of change management. And realizing and appreciating that knock-on effect is very important. So we want to affect organizational change, and this is our philosophy, but you have to start, I need one of those clickers, I bounce around too much. You have to start at an individual level. You have to look at changing the individual behavior to change the organizational way to be effective to customers, and that's our starting point. Going back to Benjamin Franklin, the individual at the center of it, the individual is at the center of everything we do. We understand it, we understand people, and trying to inculcate that and talk it in our business when there's operation rules in existence and deadlines that need to be met is not an easy task, but you have to go change from an individual level. So how do we do that? We believe the way that you affect change at an individual level, because it's a big task, is you've got to look at the motivations that are involved, the resilience, because those together equal a propensity to change. Now the temptation is to get very academic and I've taken out all the academia in terms of the slide, but what do we mean by that? I've been fascinated by the theory of motivational research and again, so much has been written on it, but what I've, what I've been interested in is over the past maybe 15, 20 years, you've, you've seen quite a strong emergence from going from quantity of motivation. Typically we've all said, how motivated are people? If we've got lots of motivation, it's a good thing. Carrot stick, however you can get it, just to motivate people because you'll get action, create emotion. To moving from well, instead of just a quantity, let's look at the quality of the motivation. How sustainable is what we're trying to do in, within and of ourselves? And do we provide the support? Because you know what it's like. You go on training, it's expensive. You, well, you're you paying attention. Now you're sitting back in the, in the job environment and you've really got to you know, put this to good work. But there's no support tool, so we often don't follow through. And these are critical <laughs> factors, and this comes from the academics. I've drawn a lot of this from self-determination theory with Nietzsche and Ryan, and it's great stuff if you want to read more on it. And then the second thing to me is resilience. And I came across Antonovsky looking into this, and there's been so much, again, that's gone into um, resilience and hardiness theory and this type of thinking. And what was interesting was Antonovsky, another researcher, found that doing a host of research, there were three things that people exhibited when they were confronted with stressful situations that enabled them to cope better than other people. And those were when they could comprehend what was going on. It was a sense of comprehensibility about it. They believed it was manageable through their own, I've actually got these definitions here, through their own resources or those of another person and they had purpose in it. Now think of yourself in a stressful situation. You're busy, you've got this huge load of work, this new project that's come your way, you're moving home, all these things. And how many times, I mean, has anyone here ever put up a really difficult task? Even just for a little bit? Of course we have, thank you. The humble guy in the back is the most honest. <laughs> Haven't you noticed when you do that, if you just take a step back, let me just chunk this, let me just piece it out and decide what I've got to do, immediately it seems a little less stressful. Then you think, well, how can I do this? How can I manage this? Well, I can, you know, I, I can work from this job aid and I can get this support. In our firm, we just call Andy, which helps them all. <laughs> and you, you look for those resources and they don't have to only be internal to you, they can be external. And then you find meaning in it. Now, I'm doing this because if I do this, it achieves that. Immediately you start, I can deal with the stress. So 
So you can apply it yourselves. Now, when we deal with change, these are the things we want to do. And there's very practical ways we deal with it, as I'll show you in a moment. We know that individuals are going to go through this change curve. We've all seen this sort of curve before. Elizabeth Kubler Ross, I like the work of John Adams. We're all going through that. And you think of a major change in your life, maybe it's moving organizations, changing jobs. What now? The only way to move forward is to let go. I think the key point is people are going to go through this. It's how we take them through it, how we progress them on this curve that's important. Because our goal as HR practitioners and leaders is to minimize that gap. There's always that drop in performance. But ultimately, we're implementing L&D, any change intervention, because we want to get from there to there and have the, the least dip possible. And how do we do that? So that's what it's about, change management. How do we do change management? Yeah. I'll flip on this. Three phases to change for us. Three phases to change for us. It's got a little bit of detail on the slide, so don't worry if you Blank out for a second, it's okay, it's there for later. The first thing we do is we believe it's important to prepare for change. So without reading all those cool consulting things we put up to make sure we can show what we're doing, we, we know what we're doing. The, this is such an important thing, and there's a lot of three phases to change, but the reason this is so important to me is we often don't prepare for change. We embark on a L&D intervention, we embark on a change program or a transformation, we, we haven't actually said, well, what is really the impact? Do we know what's involved? Have we positioned this change in the leader's minds? And in our minds, do we understand it? And people around us, have we partnered with people along the way so that when it hits, suddenly you're prepared for it? Because if you don't do this, how can you just drive into it? Because that's what we always do. This is where most organizations start, directing and delivering. Oh, you've got to do this, do it now. Okay, comms plan, training. <laughs> and we just try it so quickly. And, and all that happens is, this is actually should be the easier phase because you planned and you prepared. You'll never get it 100% right, even if you do this really well. So as you go through this process of directing and delivering change based on how you prepare for it, you've got to course correct. You've got to go through the process. We're going in this direction, we're going to change this, but you, you've got the background to do it from preparing. And the key thing is to reinforce. We often don't put the metrics for success in place. Make sure you can measure it. Manage where you, you're underperforming and then mark it for success. And through the process, it's a, it's a project management key milestones along the way you've got to deliver. This is our fun infographic that we put together. This was someone on Yanni's team. Yanni wouldn't be my presentation the whole time, but he did help me with some graphics. So <laughs> we talk about acting quickly. So just those three things, we talk about the individual at the heart of it. So when, when we're putting a slide together, people say, can't put a heart on a slide. Of course we can. We do perform as people. And it is. It's about changing the hearts and the minds of people. But looking to the outside and looking in, because Remember, ultimately we want to affect customers. So we, we quirky in our queue with our queue, so we say you've got to act quietly when impacting quickly and communicating loudly. It's all quirky because it's HR. <laughs> we know as we go through organizational change, you'll see organizations do this, right? We all know. We've seen it. What are we going to do now? Let's storm find the problem. The problem forms. This is really a great idea. <laughs> Implement it. And you just go, how do you get people to adopt and integrate the change? and ultimately perform better. So we talk about applying our change model. So you'll be able to link all those colors back, our phase one, two, and three, to various steps in the process. But just one more key point on this side is, as much as we can apply this, remember, going back to the individual. So I'm kind of bringing it back to the individual now, but, and I don't want to seem like I'm contradicting myself, this is where it's gonna happen. You've got to gently, and I said here, at the heart of the individual, expand change into the organization but you've got to start with your leadership if the leadership aren't aligned and you know this i mean i know it's a challenge for you but you have to because it just takes an influential person in your organization one careless word one careless action you know what's the point what's the point just you know get back and let's get back to real work and all your efforts are dashed it's really difficult so when you're embarking in change when you're embarking in your intervention spend time with the guys position change in their mind partner with them they understand the impact, so they prepare to invest the money and get the results. And everyone involved in implementing that change needs to be on the same page. Everyone's still there? Hold on to your seats because it's going to get quick now. <laughs> uh, it won't be too bad. So how do we now integrate this with learning and development? Well, I thought about this. Now, you guys are the experts. So if there's something I'm missing in the slide, I don't know anyone want to venture here. I know there must be some extroverts in the room. What, is, what, are we, what are we trying to do with l and Annie, what are we trying to do with l and Are we trying to grow skills? Improve performance? Hire people? Hire people? Here's my 
my little list that I came up with. Now don't judge me too quickly. I know you're the expert. We want to enhance skills, right? We want to change behaviors. We want to embed new thinking. We want to create understanding and awareness. Ensure people have the necessary know-how. Instill an organizational imperative or change. To equip and enhance job performance, right? That's sort of, these are some of the things we try and do. So do you notice any themes here? This is the change guy talking to you. But to me, l and is a change intervention. It's what you do to bring about change in an organization. You're training a new way of doing things. You want individuals to understand or become aware of something new. You want them to adopt a new set of skills and behaviors. You want them to perform better. So before you start, consider. You're dealing with individuals. The heart, the emotions, the motivations, the resilience. And you're dealing with organizational change. This is about change management when you're doing L&D. You guys aren't just L&D people or HR. You are change leaders in your organization. You have to be at the forefront of leading the change. You have to be at the forefront of leading with the individual. So if it is, then why don't we apply? We need to apply the principles of change management. How do we do this? I just took, and there's so much more we could talk about it, but I took this framework and I thought, let me just expand very briefly on it. Position that purpose in terms of what you do. Partner with those that are affected. And this is not just your leadership, but remember, just focus on the leadership before you get to an individual. But make sure that the people that are going to do the training <coughs> understand why they're doing it. Create purpose for them. We spoke about that in meetings in terms of making sure that you retain and create a good quality of motivation. So you're doing this training because here's what it's going to deliver. Here's how it's going to achieve the organizational goals. Achieving these organizational goals is going to mean this for you, for us. We're part of the same team. You bring in key messages instead of you're going in this training, you've got to report with it. We, we need to create the context for people. Context results in content for the change. <coughs> Profile the stakeholders, understand them, and prepare the environment. If we don't prepare the environment, how do you make change stick? Once you've all the LD stick when you've dealt with it. And these are simple things. They don't have to be lengthy and time consuming and expensive. These are things you can guide. And then when you're in it, now you're directing, you're delivering the change. You advertise, market, promote the purpose again. Weaken the resistance, leverage the support, because in your prepare phase, you would have identified those things. And then create networks to promote progress. Uh, we, we spoke about experiential learning, on the job training, and we spoke about how people connect. And we all, I think of myself, and I, I don't think I'm the exception, but the learning I've done over the years, I remember when I connect. I remember the emotion. Someone once said to me, it's so true, people remember the way you make them feel. End of this, how much of this content will you remember? Do you remember how you felt when you were in the session? So help people feel. And you can do that by creating networks for them to connect with. And lastly, track the adoption. See how you're doing, because we do ourselves a disservice when we don't. Manage under forms, market success, adopt, adapt to adopt, and integrate. So you create your learnings and recreate them back. Good habits of a highly effective LD leader. Firstly, if l and is about adopting a new way of thinking, a new way of doing things, five things have to happen to make it work. He wants to completely plagiarize Stephen Covey's stuff. We have to start with leaders. We've discussed this, and I think not just your executive leadership, but I think start with the informal leaders. Make sure you create that network of people in terms of what you're doing. Remember, this is learning enablement. We want to make it stick. How do we integrate? Next thing, the change team has to be a step ahead of the L&D team. So focus on that, assign someone to the top and make sure that before you go and introduce this L&D intervention, before you start developing the material, before you start rolling it up, make sure you've got change people, preparing the environment, having the discussions, creating the purpose, understanding the stakeholders, profiling, profiling the people in the environment. So be a step ahead. And then once the L&D has delivered, be a step behind. So that's a little contradictory, but naturally, as you've done that, now that the intervention has happened and you've rolled it out, and you've advertised, you've marketed, you've done all those things we said you should do, come in afterwards. Guys, how did it go? What's happening? Do you have the support? Did it work? And often we forget these little things because of the time and effort and expense it takes to develop these programs and implement them. And fourthly, if you want to change the way you do things, you have to change the way you do things. So make sure your rewards align with the changes you want. We HR, we know this, and I think looking at the LND server, I think a lot of this is done. We assign competencies, and then we make sure they're integrated with KPIs. That's good. 
sometimes we've got to check we have the right competency, but, but we have to make sure that we, when we're training something reward, when people exhibit the behavior you want, make sure leadership backs it up. Make sure you include your thinking in every way and in every area you can, it's really important. Set four things, set things in motion. Report to people, ensure they have all they need to do to do the job. 